Hi everyone, welcome to the Nicole Hollis Speaker Series 2020. Uh, I'm Lewis Heathcote, CEO of Nicole Hollis, and I am very happy today to introduce to you Dr. Brad Jacobs. Dr. Brad is a recognized leader in integrative medicine, lifestyle medicine, and corporate health, and is an experienced physician, educator, and healthcare innovator. Um, I've known Dr. Brad for a number of years. Uh, he's a terrific physician who um, I think you'll find uh, in the discussion that we're about to have, which we've asked Dr. Brad to talk to us today and to answer your questions about um, not only the current pandemic, but just how we, um, how we work and how we live and how we um, are coping with the uh, current situation of you know, the new stress and the new model of uh, how we're all having to work from home and spend so much time together. Um, and so um, I think Brad is, a re he's been such a fantastic source of inspiration, um, both for Nicole and I, and for a number of our friends and a number of his patients that um, he's given terrific information to and helped to, as well as obviously uh, full-blown medical advice when needed as well. So, Dr. Brad, um, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate you inviting you guys inviting me. Before we talk about how we're all doing, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. It's definitely a, a, a shift, and uh, I've had to make some conscious shifts in my own routine in order to stay sane and move from surviving to thriving. So, and uh, so uh, within that shift. Um, yeah, how do you make the move from survival to thriving? Um, I've had to really think about how I spend my days because it's I have a home office, and um, as a physician, I go to I go to the office still, um, but spend a lot of time in the house or in my you know within on the property, and so uh, I've had to think about you know it's easy to get up in your in your pajamas and move straight into your office and never leave and forget to eat and forget to move your body and all those other things. Um, so I've had to really consciously create a, a schedule for myself that's different than my normal routine. Got it, got it. So um, maybe we could start, um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about your background first of all and um, how you ended up here and doing what you do and uh, um, maybe talk a little about your practice as well? Sure, yeah. So uh, I'm a medical doctor by training and, and um, I've uh, sort of, you know, my orientation, I started doing martial arts as a kid, and I think that really influenced my uh, upbringing and orientation. Uh, I, I wanted to pursue medicine when I was in college. It sort of took a while to figure that out. Wasn't sure if it was going to be public health or medicine, um, straight up doctoring medicine. I ended up uh, pursuing a path in both. So I did a master's in public health at UC Berkeley because uh, I had spent a year overseas doing public health work in epidemiology, which now we all know what epidemiology is. Probably didn't know that a year ago. Um, so after doing that, then I went to medical school uh, and did my training and really wanted to bring together what we call integrative medicine, which is really uh, respecting and thinking about the um, all the disciplines in, out there for health and healing. And so that wasn't really a field when I was in my training. And now moving forward to 2020, um, as of 2016, it's now uh, its own specialty. So as a physician, you can be board certified in integrated medicine, which I am. And I've sort of led, uh, been one of the leaders sort of in the path of helping making this a reality, which is bringing together lifestyle as well as supplements and acupuncture and all the things you can think about with conventional medicine to really get the best of all worlds and help people navigate their health to help optimize their health and not just focus on disease, you know, like the old doc, I don't feel well, I'm not sleeping well, and, you know, just don't feel right. And the doc says, ah, all your labs are fine. We can't see anything. Goodbye. Um, to, oh, let's give this some thought and understand what's going on underneath the terrain. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So we've been sort of pushing forward through that. I have a medical practice called Blue Wave Medicine. And we have offices at Cavallo Point Lodge. I'm fortunate to be at Cavallo, which is in the National Park at Fort Baker, just across the Golden Gate Bridge in Sausalito. And then another office in the Financial District in San Francisco. 
And um, we do second opinion sort of consultations, but primarily it's a medical practice um, and, and focused on helping people optimize their health. We've got a team of about 12 different providers practicing all sorts of different goods medicine. Great. All right. Um, I should just jump in and quickly say, um, anybody that has any questions, please enter those in the Q&A box. And I'll keep checking those, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, screen those, and anything appropriate we'll, uh, we'll ask. Um, obviously, if you want a personal diagnosis for something very specific, then maybe we should do that offline. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, your practice obviously is, um, those that are familiar with your work will know, but um, is focused on integrative health, and as you say, that's about um, trying to diagnose more than just writing prescriptions to deal with a, a Band-Aid issue and of getting someone healthy, you know, um, in the short term, it's more about long-term health and sustainability of their uh, chosen lifestyle. Um, for those that don't know much about that, you know, I think a lot of people, when they, when they first heard about integrative health, um, most people are pretty excited about it because, you know, rightly so, you know, we've all had our experiences of um, going to doctors and just being written prescriptions for things that we've never heard of, for um, being told that we have diagnoses we don't understand, uh, and to come back in a week if 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 nothing gets better. Um, and my experience working with you, and and I can definitely attest to this, is that there's so much thought and consideration goes into what you do. Um, I think that you know maybe what people want to hear about is let's start with um, as, as this pandemic began certainly to to hit the radar in the U.S. in late January um, and for some people obviously earlier than that. Um, what kinds of questions were you being asked then? And and I'd be interested to know sort of how they've changed to now um, as people become more educated or get more more anxious or maybe resolve some of that anxiety. What kinds of things, um, you know, were you being asked then, and how's that changed? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would, so in the beginning, I think people were really uh, trying to understand how how deadly the this virus is, and there was not a lot of um, clarity around that, and um, also how bad the healthcare system capacity was going to be um, those and and what sorts of treatments could we get our hands on i think those were the predominant concerns um, and it shifted now to we know that in we're on the other side of that hump for this particular wave that's coming through uh, and so the healthcare resource utilization issue has been addressed in some areas it was a problem like new york um, in other areas, the vast majority of the United States, we did well. Um, and, but still, you know, Navajo Nation and other areas are having problems. Um, and now it's sort of shifted to um, how, no one's been asking these often directly, but they're often um, indirect. And that's what I want to speak to today a bit, uh, is what, um, how do I thrive? You know, this is like, for some people, this is becoming insane for me. Like I can't manage my children and my work and my spouse and be locked up 24 seven in this <laughs> cooker. And like, it's insanity. How do I, how do I address that? Um, very few people have said those words, but it's clear that those, that's top of mind for most of us. Uh, me included. Um, and so uh, I think that's where we're going. Now, the other question is, how long will this go for on for? Um, what is the new, you know, what I call BC and AC, you know, before and after Corona, uh, new, new definition of BC and AC. And um, what is that reality going to be like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, those, uh, I mean, I, I've got 45 questions for you right off the bat on that, you know, which I'll refrain from at this moment. I think that, um, you know, I spend endless hours, like talking to my brother, for example, about 
the before and after. We talk about misdiagnoses, diagnoses, just anecdotal information we're reading. It's pretty easy to stir ourselves up. Is there some sort of guide you'd give to people in terms of, you know, if, if uh, there's too much information out there or how to filter that or how to just, I mean, it's, it's different for everybody, but if there's some sort of guidance you could give us as to uh, what would be appropriate on a daily basis, you know, maybe not just a time constraint, but just how to think about this, because, you know, I, I'll find that I'm, I'm able to sort of process, all right, we're in this bubble um, as a family, we're in this bubble as a company, we're in this bubble as a community, a society, and we can take it by county, by state, we can look at all these stats, I can filter all that, I can feel relatively good about certain things. But then um, it just takes one new anecdotal thing of something that's been discovered or some change or mutation or something and it just sets you up again. Um, what would you say in terms of how to, how to approach all that new data? Yeah. <laughs> so my approach has been, um, I've been offering regular webinars on COVID as a way to say, look, come here. Don't feel the need to like read the, everything all the time every day all day mm -hmm. upon awakening and make sure you get it before you go to sleep because something may come up that you missed and you want like it can drive us insane so i said like let me do that work for you um i i'm good at sifting through information i like to do it i'm really good at compartmentalizing so i can do that and actually go to sleep and sleep really well um and that's just how i'm wired and then let me present that information to you in a sort of concise manner. So, uh, and I put it up on the YouTube channel, you know, Dr. Brad Jacobs, the YouTube channel. It's been helpful for people. Um, I have a lot of colleagues that are using it for their patients because, you know, they don't have the bandwidth to do it. So, um, so that's one approach, not to sort of beat my, you know, chest here at all, but much more like it's a great resource. It's free. Go use, go have a look and see what you can learn. Um, and then, you know, if you're a do it yourself sort of guy and gal, then sure. Um, you know, you, my, my suggestion, you know, good sources are the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times does a great job. Um, and they often reference the original articles, the Atlantic also. So those are sort of good sources, but again, it's 24 seven, you got to learn to regulate yourself. And my suggestion would be sort of to look, you know, once a day, ideally, um, not before you go to sleep, um, because and we can we can talk about some of this as we talk today. But you know, how do we thrive? Moving from surviving to thriving is really intentionally designing our day so that we can um, really optimize our happiness. Like we're how do we become happier as a society, as individuals, rather than sort of fear oriented? And a lot of it has to do with really having a practice and my my suggestion just to get really practical around it is to actually wake up in the morning and do a five minute reflection and gratitude practice you know wake up and just be be thank immediately thankful that you're alive like oh like you woke up you're alive now that could be like oh it could be that <laughs> the weight of being alive and having to deal with everything but just for the moment don't go there, you know, just for the moment of breathing and the like, oh, I'm alive. And if you have, you know, if you live outside the, the heart of the inner city and you can open your windows and hear birds chirping or, you know, hear nature, just to take it in for a moment can really reset you in a positive direction. And just to take it in and just be grateful and just reflect on what is there to be grateful for? You know, you, there's lots to think about that we're not, don't have to be grateful for. There's a lot going on, but just to, and just notice your breath, go back to your breath and just have a bit of a gratitude practice before you start your day. That can really sort of help self set your compass. And also a quick, quick check-in, like, am I feeling anxious today? Am I feeling angry today? You know, and sometimes dreams will come up and, and it'll just be a bit of a, uh, a check-in and then start your day. And then the other part is, schedule an exercise that day because if you don't if you're anything like me if you don't get it done early it ain't gonna happen like the day just moves and so to try and schedule a time that's in your calendar that is a meeting that you respect or it's first thing you do in the morning 
uh, can really set your compass towards the North Pole, which is really, really what we need to do. Um, so at a minimum, I would say those are two important things. And then sleep is critically important because our sleep helps boost our immune system, which is helpful for preventing becoming infected with COVID and also helpful for just living a, a healthy life. And sleep is critical for consolidating memory and innovation and creativity. Uh, it's when that all happens is during our sleep. So um, it's real important that we sleep well. And how do you do that? You have to set yourself up the night before to sleep well. So if we're doing work and multitasking before we go to sleep, if we're watching screens before we go to sleep, all these things get our mind revved up. Uh, screens, as you guys probably all know, can reduce our melatonin levels due to the color of the screen. And so, and you know, let alone the content. And so to be able to shift gears, sometimes do a stretching practice, a meditation practice, make love to your partner, whatever it is that takes you out of your mind and allows you to settle. Uh, and then you'll sleep a lot better. And those two pieces, I would say, or three, with exercise being the third leg, uh, can really sort of reorient us and get us into much more of a thriving mode and much more of a sort of a a bit more of um, less reactive and a bit more take stuff in and have the ability to pause before you respond so that you can actually choose your response rather than just have an immediate response that's emotionally triggered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's all really good advice. Um, even not during a pandemic, those are things we should be doing, right? And I think it, it's, it's that, um, you know, it's the double-edged sword of, during the pandemic, people are more that, you know, stress levels went up in different ways. Um, it made this more important, these practices, but I'm, I'm sure in the short term, I know personally speaking, um, there was a certain triage that had to happen of my own stress for a few days, few weeks, alcohol consumption's gone up nationally, internationally. But I did read um, something interesting yesterday, um, and I don't want to misquote it or misalign this, but I guess that um, there was a study done in Japan that suicide rates are actually down 20% compared to last year, April of last year, due to less stress with commuting, um, you know, work schedules, different things going on, and actually spending more time at home, although there's a whole other level of stress we've all experienced. It was actually a time that um, it seems statistically, or at least by this study, that some people were, their stress was reduced that they were experiencing. And um, that was a, a very positive uh, reaction. You know, I, I think as you talk about the before COVID and after COVID, um, I'd be interested to know what you think will be the sort of longer term changes in how we relate to each other, the sort of positive things that we could think about that could be a fundamental change in how we approach those three things you just mentioned so that it could be a, a, a reboot for us as individuals, but us as a community as well. Yeah, uh, there's so much to talk about there, Lewis. <laughs> so um, first I'll say that this is the time to, for us to, to reconstruct our lives and how we want to live our life. Like we, as individuals and as a society, you know, our, our consumption of goods and products is down dramatically. And hmm, is that bringing us more happiness? Maybe it is, our consumerism has been reduced. Now, what happens to the economic engine as a result of that, it's another conversation, but, um, but maybe you know, buying the newest best thing isn't bringing us the happiness we thought it was. And so all of a sudden we're relating closer to our nuclear family and to sort of our close you know, one. So, that's one is it's really an opportunity to redesign our own personal lives. Like you said, the commute time, there is no commute time. The, my commute time is walking a hundred feet to my, to my office, uh, which is oh in the home, right? Or so, um, and for a lot of us, it's that way. So that's changed things a lot. And if a lot, some people are going to their offices, which some people are, you know, the commute, no one's on the road. So or relatively speaking. So things have changed and that's helped people a lot. It's also when you're forced to be with people, you figure out a way to make it work, right? Um, and so there isn't any other option. And so actually a lot of relationships are actually doing better uh, because they're with you one another 
and they have a common sort of enemy, if you will. We have this virus that's a common enemy that unites all of us. It's sort of like having an extraterrestrial being come in to the planet. It creates planetary union. Uh, and we find that our differences are smaller than we thought they were, and we can actually get along. And we have something common that we are aligning against. So that brings us together, which is a beautiful thing. Um, so I feel like there, there's a huge opportunity there. And so that's one part. The other part um, at the societal level is really how we're going to be spending our time. You know, do we have to go to fly to, um, you know, Hawaii or Japan or wherever we're flying for these business meetings? We find now, mm, maybe we don't, and maybe we are more productive uh, in the home and you, or in the office, if you will, once we go back to the office and we don't need to get on planes and travel as much. And we could do this from remotely. I know in healthcare, for example, it's dramatically changed, uh, and it will that will have it for an imprint forever. So, in moving forward, so for example, less than two percent of healthcare visits were done through telemedicine, and now sixty five percent at UCSF are being done uh, through, or seventy percent being done through telemedicine. In a heartbeat, we've been trying to make that change over a decade, and it took this that literally in two and a half weeks, Kaiser Permanente, UCSF, you name most facilities have changed on a dime. So um, there's lots of things that are changing. So your doctor's visit, for example, small one, just the other side of it is often will be done through telemedicine now. Um, we have a company, it's one of my other ventures that we're focused on called The Cusp, that's focused on women transitioning through menopause. It's a telemedicine company. And we're, it's young, it's a startup. And, you know, all of a sudden, this event has dramatically changed the adoption rate of telemedicine because it's focused on women that are 45 and older, you know, roughly 45 to 65. And they, you know, or, or see my gynecologist over a telemedicine visit? How are you going to do a pelvic exam? Like, I don't understand. And now it's clear as day. It's menopause. You don't need a pelvic visit. You don't need a pelvic. And telemedicine is very, something that people are very accustomed to. So, Again, there's a lot of shifts um, that are gonna have long-term implications. The one question that is yet to be really fully fleshed out is how do we in interact socially? And in the setting of this, let's pretend there's no vaccine, which there will be, but let's just pretend. Or in reality, let's pretend it takes two years for you to get a vaccine yourself. So let's say a vaccine, just to give you a time horizon, let's say we have a vaccine in 12 months which would be very optimistic. Maybe by the end of the year, doubtful, let's say 12 months from now. Then we've got to manufacture it. And then we've got to give it to 7 billion people. Now the United States may get it first if it's made by a US-based manufacturer that's, and the manufacturer can control the inventory because it's in the, if it's, unless it's in China, who knows what, what will happen to the inventory, like our N95 masks, but, um, so let's say it's a two-year run. So how are we going to interact? We can't do this for two years. We're not going to stay in lockdown for two years. So what we call mitigation measures. So we need to learn to reintegrate. So what would that be like? Well, it may not be as much of the hugging and the kissing. And in Europe in particular, that's going to be different. We do a lot of handshaking. Um, so it won't be as much handshaking. But can we continue to socially engage? And the answer is yes. And this, we, what, we're trying, what we need to set up is just ways to break down the transmission rate what we call the r not the reproductive rate. Now, well, so that, you know, I, we were all thinking about that right now, right? So I'm sure there's going to be questions coming in about that. I, um, my question is, so we're now talking, and it's different county by county, state by state, but here in California, um, Los Angeles has different rules than, say, San Francisco County does in terms of when and where to wear a mask. Um, and then there's different types of masks. And then I'm reading, you know, obviously difference between cloth masks, N95 masks, and bandana. Some things filter in and out. Some things only filter out, right? So what would you... Um, I'm interested to know if we're going to reintegrate and we're going to use different methods to get our economy going, to get back out, you know, into some sort of functioning workplace... Um, to get restaurants open to a certain extent and still social distance. Um, what do you recommend, you know, in terms of what the guidance is in the next few weeks, people get prepared for, get ready to do? 
but there's certain things they need to buy, there's certain actions they need to take. Yeah, so masks are critical. Um, and if you look at Asia, you know, the people were been wearing masks for quite some time. We always sort of looked at him like that's peculiar. Um, partly it was maybe related to pollution, partly it was related to SARS. Um, but the bottom line is we're gonna need masks. Um, and, you know, in, in ranking order, the N95 is the best one, and then there's a surgical mask, and then there's a cloth mask. Then you, within cloth, you can talk about, is it a bandana or is it like one that's actually designed with a filtering, like coffee filters and double woven cotton, and some masks are being made with a substance called algaen, which has it's copper and silver impregnated into the polypropylene or into the cotton, and that will it has antiviral properties. So there's a range of ways to think about it. Wearing the N95 mask is impossible 24 hours a day because a true N95 mask is properly fitted, which no one gets a fit test, but there's something called a fit test, where you breathe in the bitters, and if you can taste the bitters or smell the bitters, then it's getting through the seams and it's not fitting you correctly. No one gets those outside of healthcare facilities where you're, you're put into a hood, you're wearing this mask, they spray bitters into the hood, and if you can taste or smell those bitters, then the, they have to refit the N95. When properly fitted, it's really uncomfortable. And, and so it's just not practical. It's by far the best filtration system because it can reduce it to 0.3 microns, and, um, and which is fantastic, but because uh, the virus is larger than that. Um, and it filters out 98 plus percent of the, of the uh, substance. So, uh, but practically speaking, surgical masks or well-made cloth masks, um, and so, and they need to be worn whenever you're in close proximity to other people. So if you're uh, in an elevator, if you're in stairways, if you're in a grocery store, you know, places where there's close proximity. Um, and then outside, no reason to wear it when you're driving your car. I see lots of people wearing their masks driving their car. No need to. Or if you're out in the street walking around. If you're driving an Uber, then surely you're in, a, you're in the car with uh, someone you don't know, right? Yeah. Now, if you're doing a ride share, right. Then, and you know, again, what ventilation is critical. So rolling down the windows, and I would get in an Uber and have the windows down. So even if it's cold, just wear your jacket, like let it ventilate. Um, and same with our indoor air quality, which is another big issue that we should talk about, which is indoor air quality is real important. We're spending a lot more time indoors in our homes in particular and in office buildings. But thinking about the indoor air quality is really important. We know for a fact that by having proper ventilation, you can reduce rates by 30 to 50%. There's been studies looking at this for influenza. So mm -hmm. cracking a window on two sides of a home um, allows for cross ventilation, which reduces that. Same in the office space. We should have vent fans, windows open, getting the air moving out so that you reduce the, the viral particulate that's in the atmosphere. So do you, um, so if two people are wearing masks and they are in, should they still not be within six feet of each other? Correct. And if it's you and your wife, yeah. that's different. If it's, uh, but two people that don't, that aren't in, you know, frequent social, you know, proximity to one another, um, then yeah, they should be wearing masks. So and this goes back to what I was saying earlier. So everything we do cuts down the rate. Not, there's not a bullet. The one bullet is the vaccine. So short of the vaccine, which is the silver bullet. But again, the vaccine may be, if you take, for example, Shingrix, which was for herpes zoster vaccine, shingles vaccine. The first vaccine was only 51% effective. Only a decade or so later did this most recent vaccine come out that's 97% effective. So right. when we think of vaccine, it may not be 100% effective. The flu vaccine is 30 to 50% effective every year, right? Or maybe 65% effective, depending on the year, if we match it right. So this vaccine is not going to be 100% effective, by the way. So, um, but it will dramatically cut down the reproductive number, right? Which is the number, if I'm infected, how many people do I infect? Which currently is 2.2, roughly, we think. But... If you take that number, that means we're not doing anything. We're walking around, hanging out, doing our normal thing in society. But all these different factors affect that reproductive number, which then knocks down the likelihood that you'll get infected. So if I wear a mask 
then I'm reducing it by, let's say, a third. And if you wear a mask, it's being reduced by another third. Mm -hmm. And if I wash my hands frequently, then again, we're reducing it again. If I stay six feet apart, it brings it down again. So all these things cumulatively reduce the, the likelihood of you getting affected. And that's what you're trying to do. So how many of these can we put in place so that the likelihood that are not reproductive number goes to 0.5 at the societal level. So then it just immediately dies because it doesn't continue to propagate. Right. If you think about having offspring, the virus having offspring, if the number's two, the virus is creating two offspring, and then that one creates two. If it's 0.5, you no longer have offspring. Like, right? Right. right. Yeah. Um, no, that makes sense. And, you know, and even as a company, we're, we're having discussions about how would reopening look and people obviously wearing masks and putting up some sort of barriers and reconfiguring desks so they're further apart and closing small conference rooms, taking people's temperature when they come in. You know, we know that it's spread when people are asymptomatic. And obviously if we find out through further testing that so many more people have had it, then we say, oh, well, great. The mortality rate is lower than we expected, but it also means it's more infectious than we ever believed. You know, so it's it's one or the other. It's either less infectious, but because the mortality rate currently seems uh, dramatic, and we know from all everything we're reading and hearing about hospitals, it's been really um, you know a shocking experience for the whole healthcare sector for those people brave enough to go in every day and and work in those environments. It's been um, a life changing experience. Um, so I, I want to change direction a little bit I got a question uh, about spending time outside and it actually relates directly to your practice um, Vincent asks with one of your offices located in a national park I'm curious to know how or if you integrate the health benefits of nature into your practice do you prescribe outdoor activity to your patients great thanks for teeing that up um, Vincent so Yes, I do. And um, I, I often go for a walk with my patients outdoors on the property. There's 80 acres there at Cavallo Point within, uh, within 80,000 uh, in the Marin Headlands there. So we'll often go for a walk. So I can sort of look, review labs and other things and then have them in my mind and go for a walk and talk. And and that's been a wonderful thing because first of all, we talk about different things we normally would talk about because we're sort of walking side by side and we're in nature and other things come up then if I'm looking across the table from someone sitting in an office. Um, and secondly, so you sort of get different material brought up. You go for a little, you go for a walk, which brings a little bit of exercise. You get vitamin D from being outside, which is good for us as well. Good for mood uh, and, and good for just being out in nature so it's really a, a, a beautiful thing to do and I do I think nature is a, a beautiful thing because it provides a container that's larger than ourself and so when you have a container larger than yourself it puts in perspective the of what's going on so uh, for example when my father was ill and he passed away about 27 years ago but when he was ill I can remember the profound sort of comfort and feeling of this container that was larger than me by being in nature. It really, you know, supports you, us and anchors us and it puts life in perspective. Um, and so I'm a huge fan of nature. Thankfully in the Bay Area, there's a lot of nature to be found, even in the city with Golden Gate Park and the, uh, the multiple parks that are around. Um, and obviously all around outside San Francisco as well as, you know, most of the United States, we can find nature. So I do prescribe it. I do recommend it. Um, I try to tell people to, if we can to spend some time in nature every day, if you can, and if you can't, at least, you know, on the weekends and whenever you can get yourself there, whether it's on the beach or whether it's in a park or whether it's out in the mountains. Should people be wearing masks when they're doing activity outdoors? Yeah. So if you are exercising on a track, like in a high school or something, and there's lots of people exercising around you, yes. If you're out on a trail, you don't need to wear a mask. If you come across people on a close trail, let's say, uh, and you're in close proximity, just hold your breath and keep moving, right? <laughs> so, um, but if you find that you're in a concentrated area, let's say it's Golden Gate Park and it's a Sunday and there's a lot of people, then yeah, wear a mask. If, it's all about proximity. 
So I often tell people, bring a mask wherever you are, so that way you can use it. Um, but you frequently don't need it. Now, if someone's running by you and panting, um, which, and they don't have good social awareness and they come close to you, then again, hold your breath, either put the mask on as they're approaching or just hold your breath as they pass and then you know move, move on. So it's a bit of social awareness and it's all about proximity. If, you know, and outdoors, it, there's ventilation that's beautiful. And so it's just that momentary moment when someone's coming by you, if they cough or sneeze or panting, you know, then, then it's a concern. To be specific, if you're jogging behind somebody or riding your bike behind someone, let's say you go biking together with somebody, uh, which I've done a lot, mountain biking or road biking, you know, if you're straight right behind them and they're breathing hard, that you are getting their stream. So don't advise that. You don't want to sort of drag behind someone and, you know, right now, unless you trust them and know them and that they're not infected. Um, but that's something you want to avoid. It's hard to exercise wearing masks. You can, um, but it's a little bit more cumbersome. Got it. Um, we have another question here. Um... From Zephyr, uh, can you recommend some immunity boosting and or meditative centering practices that we can do at home during quarantine? Great, yeah. So um, meditative practices, uh, and then we can talk about immune boosting. So meditative practices is, um, like I had mentioned in the beginning, I, I, I'm a big believer in a gratitude practice. I feel like particularly in the Western civilization in developed countries, particularly the United States, uh, we don't really appreciate how fortunate we are and a lot of our, and we're much more likely to worry and um, feel, you know, inadequacy or insecurity and fear um, and lot, much less gratitude. I, I can remember when I was 21 and I lived in Africa and we went out to the bush for a while. I was in Zaire, which is now called the Democratic Republic of Congo um, or the DRC. And I remember waking up at 4.30 in the morning, hearing the sounds of women singing. It is beautiful sound, beautiful voices. Um, and it was women had gotten up about an hour prior, so maybe 3.30 in the morning, got in a canoe, went downstream to get water to bring back for their small village. And they were coming back. Now imagine having to wake up and spend three hours just to get water, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they were so happy and joyful and content. And the singing was echoing through the valley. Um, and it just was so resonant to me, like, wow. They have so little, yet they find happiness. Um, so a gratitude practice, um, you can find them online. You can you know, download, there's different apps, there's Headspace, there's Calm, there's Beautify, there's a range of different apps you could use. Um, I highly recommend. Um, and then the other pieces are, like I said, sleep is really immune boosting, napping, like these things really reset our immune system. So, and then exercise. So those three, in addition, uh, and then it comes to supplements per se, um, there are things that are quite helpful. On a daily chronic basis, I'm a huge fan of medicinal mushrooms. So those mushrooms are a combination formula and they often have, um, I'm a fan of a guy named Paul Stamets. He has a company called Host Defense. Um, I don't own any equity in that company, but I'm a big proponent. Um, and then it'll have a range of mushrooms. So reishi, shiitake, maitake, um, and a range of different mushrooms that are really helpful for the immune system. You can do them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And, um, now, there are other things like zinc lozenges that have been shown to be quite effective for COVID, actually. We think that it can be quite helpful. Um, and as well as quercetin, which can some onions. Um, so, and vitamin C. Uh, so, just to start, you know, the, there's some evidence of vitamin D as well. So, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc lozenges, quercetin. And, uh, sorry, are these all preventative? Or, you know, in some regard, they're to boost your immune system even if you're not feeling you have symptoms or is it, oh, I think I'm getting some sort of weird cold-like symptoms. Maybe I should boost up on all these things. Yeah, so there's no data straight up for COVID-19 on any of this. This is all sort of hypothetical based on other corona-like viruses or mm -hmm. other viruses in general. And what we know their effects on that are beneficiary 
on the immune system. So it's one of those two paths, they're antiviral or help the immune system. For the mushrooms, we know it helps the immune system. And for vitamin D, uh, we um, think that it has both, it helps the immune system, actually primarily the immune system. And for vitamin C and for zinc and quercetin, we think it has antiviral properties, typically in the setting of an infection. So the latter of what you just said, right? So you're starting to feel like, oh, I may be having, something's going on. It's time to sort of take vitamin C. Melatonin has been looked at as well, actually, and then thought to have some properties. So vitamin C, um, quercetin, and zinc lozenges. So I just want to iterate zinc lozenges, not zinc glycinate, for example, which is helpful for, or in zinc, I should say zinc carnosine, which is helpful for gut healing, but zinc lozenges, which are made for the common cold, for example, uh, those in the setting of being sick, I wouldn't do them daily preventatively. I would do it if you thought you're feeling ill, but on a daily preventative level, the medicinal mushrooms, vitamin D, you could you also use melatonin for sleep, which also has, it's helpful for reflux and also is thought to have some uh, properties as well, as well. Got it. All right. Um, that's helpful. And you know, we can always um, maybe write some of that down and, and send that out to anyone that um, is interested in more information. Um, speaking of which, I mean, so generally, so to get more, more information, you have a webinar, it's on YouTube. You know, I'm happy to suggest that, promote it. I've watched it. I've logged in numerous times. I think it's great. Um, and it is hard, as we say, to really identify where how to funnel all this information that's out there, you know, on all these topics. Um, Christina has a good question, um, and it really focuses on, I'm just set it up, uh, a lot of us are thinking about how to be involved in the community and how to help, but there's a concern. It's like, oh, I want to go and volunteer and do whatever it is, but then I'm worried about my household, I'm worried about, um, obviously, the infection level, right, and, and the, the risk. So what she's asking is, um, what would you suggest for those who are volunteering their time to, um, to assist compromised communities? Any additional things besides masks and constant hand washing so that they can limit their ability to spread? Yeah, um, not really. I mean, those are the main things, to be honest with you. So what we just talked about, so, you know, sleep, is important. You don't want to go into a situation where your immune system is weakened. Uh, mm -hmm. What we do know about this particular virus, uh, which sort of um, is a beautiful manifestation or sort of representation of uh, what we've been talking about as preventive medicine doctors like myself, is that your health coming into being sick is critically important to your ability to survive this illness or to do, you know, become less ill if you are affected, not end up in the hospital. And what, what I mean specifically is if you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, if you have lung issues, these things affect how sick you get and your risk of dying as well. The vast majority of people that are dying are sick before they walk in. In other words, chronically ill. They're overweight. They have metabolic issues that relate to diabetes, for example, high blood pressure. A lot of these are lifestyle related and they're dramatically accelerated now in the setting of COVID. So if you look at the folks that are dying, you'll, and the data will become clearer and clearer over time, a lot of them have these co what we call comorbidities. So if we can get ourselves healthier, losing weight, reverse our diabetes, lifestyle is 80% of this. So that's you know, not an immediate thing and not the directly the question she's being asked, but I wanted to highlight how important that is. So right. that's something that we haven't talked about. I want to make sure that we get across. If you want to prevent yourself from getting sick or your loved one worried about them getting sick, get them to get on a lifestyle program. Now, this is around for two years, at least. So you got plenty of time. Three months can make a huge difference in people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then boosting your immune system through sleep, meditation, exercise. is critical to, uh, to preventing yourself from becoming ill. And then to at the then you know medicinal mushrooms on a regular basis um i am a huge fan of um and then the other pieces that sort of in the setting relate to mass social distancing hand washing is really the the predominant features okay great 
Um, you know, we only have a few minutes left and um, I would actually like to finish up by, uh, I don't want to spring this on you or anything, Dr. Brad, but um, you talked about a gratitude uh, meditative practice and, and I see that we have, um, you know, a large number of people participating in this webinar. And um, I think maybe it'd be great if you could actually lead the group in a gratitude meditation. Would you be able yeah. to do that? I'd be del delighted to do so. Okay. Um, and depending on time and questions, we could even do a bit of a, a movement Qigong practice too. So just to give people a little instruction on that. So why don't we start with the gratitude practice and see how, how time goes. That sounds great. Great. So why don't, if, if everyone could then sort of get yourself comfortable if you're lying, I encourage you to sit up. Um, if you're standing, you can stay standing in, or, or get yourself, you know, be seated and just uh, sit comfortably. If you could uncross your legs, uncross your hands if they're crossed, your legs, you know, get yourself in a comfortable position and notice, find your sit bones underneath you. And um, a lot of times, like what I'm doing now is I move to the edge of, of the chair. It helps me stay a little bit more uh, upright and rather than slouching against the back of the chair. Um, and allow your feet to be settled onto the ground uh, comfortably. And I would uh, just go ahead and place your hands either on your legs or you can put one hand on your belly uh, and another hand on your chest and just notice your breath. A lot of times um, I, I like to keep my eyes open. Some people prefer to close them. So whatever's more comfortable. If you do keep your eyes open, I encourage you to just have a downward gaze with your eyes so that you're looking about six feet in front of you uh, on the floor, roughly six feet in front of you. So it's somewhat of a 45 degree angle downward gaze. Uh, for me, if I close my eyes, my mind tends to start working, you know, getting activated and start thinking. So I tend to keep my eyes open, but whatever's comfortable for you. And I encourage you to just notice your breath, notice your posture and your body. You don't have to change your posture, just notice it. A nice way to keep our mind occupied is to count our breath. And I don't mean count the breaths per se, but actually count the number moments within a single breath. So if I were to lead you as you breathe in, you can count one, two, three, four. And then as you breathe out, you'd count for about a count of five or six. The goal is to breathe out a little bit longer than it takes to breathe in. So if it's too long to count to four in, then count to three. And then as you exhale, count to four or five out. One, two, three. By doing a prolonged exhalation, what happens is it activates the calming part of our nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system, and helps calm us down. So that brings that into balance with our sympathetic nervous system. So really allowing the breath a long exhalation. We breathe in. It's normal for us to have our minds be active. So, you know, a lot of us don't like to meditate because we can't clear our minds and we get frustrated, but what that's a really a misnomer. Meditation's about just awareness and noticing 
what our minds are thinking about, noticing our posture, noticing how we're feeling, checking in with ourself. It's not about clearing everything out of our mind and becoming the Buddha. Um, it's really just about being aware and just noticing ourselves. And then in that process, what happens is we learn to separate or we learn to realize, I should say, that there is a separation. There is a difference between who we are as beings and what our mind and emotion is doing. That our mind, our thoughts, our emotions are not us, our being. They're a manifestation. They're an echo of our being. And gaining that realization that our being is core and our thoughts and our emotions are an echo allows us to separate and to have free choice and free will and how we choose to act and think and feel so just to go back to our breath and just notice if we have thoughts our thoughts and notice our body any emotions that are coming up, just to witness them and let them pass. And now I invite you to Spend a moment just checking in with ourself. If there's a little voice inside you speaking or, you know, the, the little being in you, the child in you, it's, there's a narrative going, just check in with that narrative, that little, little child. Sometimes it's saying, you know, I'm anxious, this is boring, I'm agitated, I'm worried about what's happening today. I got so much to do. Why is my partner, why did they yell at me yesterday? Whatever is going on, just soothe, provide some soothing reassurance that everything's going to be okay. And I invite you to just acknowledge and bear witness to your health, that you have good health right now, that you're vibrant, that your body's intact. And just a moment of appreciation for all the goodness that you are experiencing that you are fortunate to have right now. A lot of times we focus on what's missing, but to spend a moment just acknowledging and appreciating our health, our good fortune. We have jobs, we're working, we have a purpose. That we are part of the fortunate in this moment. And if you could spend a moment just thinking about, imagine a good friend or a loved one approaching you, that warm hearted, beautiful sensation, that love that you feel as they approach you and just sink into that feeling. Allow a smile to come across your face or your heart to feel warmed. By their presence. And I invite you, if you're, if you're willing, 
to allow, give some compassion to all those that are suffering in the world now, to all the health professionals that are working tirelessly, the frontline responders, whether they're paramedics, or police, fire department, those that are ill in the hospitals right now, the family members of those that are suffering, just to send out love and compassion to them and our prayers for their healing. And then just coming back to our own self and to feel the good fortune that we do have with our health and our vitality and how fortunate we are and how we can use that energy to do good in the world by as simple as smiling to a stranger, as simple as being kind to someone who's clearly upset, even if they're upset at you. So coming back to our body for a moment and feeling our body wiggling our fingers opening our eyes if they're closed. Take a big breath in and let it out. Let's do a few of those for a little bit. Breathe in deep. Big exhale and one more time. And I invite you to rub your hands together. generate a little bit of heat. And then we're gonna cover our eyes and bring all that energy into our eyes, which from a Chinese medicine perspective is the liver comes out through our eyes. So breathe in deep and big exhale. One more time. Breathe in deep. And a big exhale. And one last time. Great. So that was a few moments, and I hope that it was centering for you and gives you a little bit of energy to start your day. Thank you so much. Dr. Brad, um, that was really an exceptional talk, um, finished by a really, really great practice that um, I think we would all benefit from doing, as you say, on a daily basis. And it doesn't take long. And I can already feel a, a huge difference. So thanks again. Um, appreciate you coming and speaking to us. and. Um, We'll have more information for people that want to find your videos or want to get further information on your practice. Um, and thanks everybody for their questions. Thank you for all the participants for um, being part of this. And we look forward to speaking to you again for the next Nicole Hollis Speaker Series 2020 event, which will be, I believe, on Tuesday. So thanks again, Dr. Brad. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.